Welcome to our updated Saskatchewan Super Insulated Deep Winter Greenhouse Tour. Let me take you inside. I hope you enjoy. So it is the end of October, uh, going to be November right away, 2022, our first tour I did nine, ten months ago in January 2022, and we've done a lot since then. So um, everything's working great on the greenhouse, and let me take you inside. So it's early morning here, just got time to whip out a quick tour. It's nice and toasty warm in here. Uh, furnace didn't even run last night and it's 8 30 in the morning furnace is set for 10 degrees celsius we've got a thermometer next to our passion fruit which has fruit on it and it is 18 degrees uh, so it got below freezing last night and it's holding up significantly better than our first tour with all the things that we have added so one thing we did, the big one, was concrete. So um, again, I did everything on the greenhouse myself, the concrete prep work, the in-floor heat piping, um, everything except for the concrete pour day where we had a concrete pump truck and um, eight finishers. The job is just too big. I can't do it myself, right? So, but. Uh, True to my concept, we did a light colored concrete, painted it a light color here. I had painted it white, but it looked like a hospital, so I went with a light earthy tone. And then I switched it to black for the winter sun. Um, so the difference in temperature from the sun hitting these concretes is anywhere from 10 to 20 degrees Fahrenheit temperature difference on the concrete surface. So where essentially where I want the sun thermal energy to collect, I painted black, and where I want it to reflect and not collect, like in the heat of the summer, it's painted a light color. So the concrete's really nice, it keeps the humidity down a fair bit, and there's no dust in here, so all of our plants during construction, they'd have dust on the leaves and things, and now it's nice and clean, not dusty whatsoever, and uh, yeah, we can keep it quite clean. So again, half of the greenhouse footprint, raised beds and in-ground beds, uh, is planted in dirt in the ground, half of the footprint. The other half of the greenhouse is concrete. Um, and it's also growing area, but for plant starts and our tray racking for microgreens and potted fruit trees and things like that. So uh, actually, let me switch the camera around so you, I can show you. You don't have to look at me the whole time. There we go. So it's looking really nice. Everything's lush in here. We're getting lots of food in here. Wife had lots of flowers in here. And uh, yeah, everything's doing good. One issue we have this year, uh, we don't have an aphid issue or a fruit fly issue but we have for the first time a white fly issue. And I don't think they do any harm to the plants or anything. It's just kind of, they are a little bit annoying. Um, but we did introduce some beneficial bugs and the kids were collecting ladybugs. But I would imagine the parasitical wasps that naturally took out our aphid problem last winter are gonna do the same thing this winter as well. Otherwise, everything's perfect in here. There's no powdery mildew. It's not overly humid. Uh, everything is super, super happy and doing really, really well. So again, the uh, summer solstice comes in here. The sun is at a 63 degree angle in the heat of the summer. So it doesn't touch any black concrete. And in the winter time when it's cold the winter solstice goes all the way hitting my rainwater collection things about a foot up 
and it hammers the entire black wall. So everything black that I want the sun thermal energy to absorb, uh, it only happens in the coldest part of the winter. And again, the temperature difference is 10 to 20 degrees Fahrenheit from the sun hitting this to this. So in the heat of the summer, those odd days that are plus 30 Celsius or more, it is, you know, same temperature or cooler in the greenhouse um, than it is outside. So like here in, on a sunny day in the summer, you're in the sun, so it's warm, but this is all shaded from here back. And it's cooler in here with no fans going, but, and, and again, we have no high ventilation with my design because it doesn't overheat. Um, just the doors open, this one, this one, and the bus windows along the bottom, and the entrance door over here. And it stays cooler in here in the summer, no fans, nothing than outside. In the winter time, um, last winter, before we had concrete and thermal mass storage and before it was kind of closer to completion, if it was minus 50 Celsius outside, it would be like plus 35 Celsius in here on a sunny day. And I'm hoping that all of that thermal energy is going to collect in the concrete. There's in-floor heat pipes in here. It's not hooked up or filled up yet, but the water in there also is going to heat up. All of this thermal mass, this is uh, 20,000 pounds or, or uh, 10,000 liters of rainwater collection, fresh water. This is going to be protected from the sun hitting it and the natural light so I don't get any algae. But uh, I'm behind on my YouTube videos. Um, so as soon as I do a full YouTube video on the rainwater collection system um, and these water tanks up on this heavy duty pallet racking, I'm going to protect that from the light. Uh, I had 45 gallon black steel drums up here as my passive thermal mass. So they were just filled with water, completely did the entire system. And I ended up taking that out. The reason why I took that out is it was, it took up uh, 32 square feet of floor space along the back wall. And because I'm getting into fish tanks now, the fish tanks were blocking the sun. So if I'd have a fish tank, I wanted it at the back of the greenhouse and then it blocked the 45 gallon drums and made those essentially useless. So instead of the 45 gallon stagnant water drums, now I'm going to have fish tanks with black poly to absorb the heat of the sun all along the back. And I've got room for nine fish tanks back here, black. So in this fish tank here, I have brook trout. And they are a cold water fish and one koi in there. And in here I have tilapia. Tilapia are a warm water fish. So this fall, the trout, the water temperature was getting a little bit high where they were not happy. And the tilapia were flourishing because of higher water temperatures. Now that it's cooling off a little bit, the water temperature slightly dropped. So the tilapia aren't as active and won't be growing as fast. But the brook trout are super happy and they're eating quite a bit more because they're they like the cold water, they flourish in the cold water. So again, I don't want to be spending, you know, 400 watts to 1500 watts on heaters to heat water. So I'm trying different species of fish to see what's going to work properly. But um, so I, I'll probably shade the brook trout so it stays even cooler, like put a piece of insulation in front for now. But the black tanks, I want the sun to absorb that. So it's the same concept as my 45 gallon drums I had set up, except for this is usable space and it serves a purpose um, over and above just stagnant water barrels.
Uh, the so pe people and myself, this is iffy when you realize that this is over twenty thousand pounds of water up on scaffold racking. It's a little bit freaky, uh, <laughs> but I thought it was worth the money. Uh, I I. Just like my 45-gallon drums, I permanently set those up, but I did a YouTube video. I set these up in a cube, three wide, three high, and that worked fine, but the sun would hit it, and it was, again, using up floor space. So I went back to my original plan and got this rather pricey pallet racking. Like, each one of these beams is $110 for the uh, thicker, heavier-duty ones. But uh, each beam is, or each shelf system is good for 6,500 pounds, which is more than I needed. And each vertical is good for 20,000 pounds plus. So I know it looks a little iffy, and just when you know the weight of it, but it, uh, it's fine. And I upgraded to two inch uh, lines. And being up high, I get a little bit more gravity pressure. So, and having just one row, it allows me to um, turn off valves of the tanks and separate tanks. So let's say I just wanted to empty these two for some reason. I can just leave these two open and close off these. Right now I have them all open. But I, it's very versatile. I have a, a valve to the pipe, and this I'm actually going to do gravity feed to my bathroom to fill the toilet and stuff so it's all gravity um, so I won't even need electricity for that but also putting valves uh, every so often so underneath this valve I can make adjustments put other valves and the whole idea with this is uh, no electricity gravity feed so my rainwater is going to come in there, and again, I ran out of time, but the eaves are going on the shop and the back of the greenhouse, uh, or sorry, the eaves trough, and that's going to come in the building and gravity fill up all my tanks uh, in one big system, and then from the tanks, gravity feed to pipes where I can just have a hose and water things, but when I line all these with fish tanks at the back, gravity feed to a float valve to keep the water uh, the same height, and gravity feed with room temperature water, uh, so not ice cold well water, to do changes in my fish tanks to make the fish happier. And then with all the fittings I had, the fish tanks are gonna look like this. They're gonna be plumbed together with the valves. So every so often, if this is a fish tank, I'm just going to open up this valve and water the greenhouse with uh, the dirty fish water, and it'll naturally do a changeover to give the fish fresh water. So that is fertilizer for the plants in the greenhouse, and that makes the fish happier. So gravity rain to gravity tanks to gravity... Uh, fill the fish tanks, gravity changeovers, and if I don't have enough pressure, I'm also going to hook up, I got a used uh, jet pump, and I'm going to hook up, hook it up to a valve to directly, if I just want to water with fresh water, and also hook it up to fish water. So when I do a tank changeover, you just open up this valve, uh, plumb it up, goes to the jet pump or gravity, and goes to all my watering systems and pipes that they put in the greenhouse, and it could be drip system or a sprinkler system, but uh, essentially automating the whole thing without the use of very much electricity, if any. Uh, okay, well, what else am I doing here? This, uh, probably just going to have fish tanks, but I did put a wire for a hot tub if I feel like uh, I'm going to relax in my life for once. But And this would fit a hot tub type of thing. Good use of space, the water tanks above, uh, hot tub there. And again, I could naturally fill with nice soft rainwater, the hot tub, so just with gravity. 
but this is a four-piece bathroom and just a wet bathroom for ease of cleaning. So if I have farm workers or just somebody's hanging out in here, but uh, shower drain, everything slopes to the drain. Everything will be waterproof. I might tile it or something, but toilet, little change room bench and uh, pedestal sink. Next to the bathroom is the sauna. So there'll be a screen door here and this will be, I'll line it with cedar on the inside and uh, just as if I built a sauna outside in its own shed, but I upgraded my wood stove to a larger one that I had. I actually took this one out of the shop um, and with non-combustible material like concrete board and steel studs, I'm going to half build this wood stove so this half is in the sauna and this half is out of the sauna and I can load wood here. Now in the winter when life slows down a little bit I'm going to bring in our patio furniture and this door is pretty much closed all the time but this will be a nice little sitting area hangout area for our extreme terrible winters. And this is convenient. I have fire, can put my firewood storage out here, bring firewood. So essentially every evening I'll be having a uh, fire in the wood stove probably anyways. After my day's done, I probably just put some wood in there, have a wood stove. What I have, the wood stove, which I'm using as supplemental heat for the greenhouse on the coldest nights of the year. When I have that going, that means your sauna is going, so it's convenient. You can come in, uh, just go in the screen door, regulate it with the screen, might do a power duct, send some heat to have a nice warm bathroom. Um, but come in here, warm your bones without any extra. Like if, if you have a sauna outside and it's minus 40, nobody wants to go fire up a separate wood stove and, you know, uh, have a sauna outside. So I, I just know myself uh, if I have a sauna going everybody's going to use it but if I had a separate building with a separate wood stove and a separate thing to deal with I'd never uh, utilize it. Uh, above the bathroom and the sauna I'm going to extend my water storage system. Uh, I have some IBC totes that are 500 liters instead of a thousand and with uh, heavy duty or lots of joists up there I've got room for another I don't know four tanks uh, some of those I might insulate and integrate that the insulated tanks in with my in-floor heat system and the solar uh, evacuated tube water heaters uh, so this I haven't hooked up yet. I need a, I have the manifolds. I have to put the manifolds on, connect it to my shop manifolds, which I also don't use, and put a circulation pump. But uh, and just run a plumbing pipe to some insulated tanks. So essentially, the idea is on top of the greenhouse. I'm not doing my solar photovoltaics. That's going on a barn roof that I'm building next year. But up here, I might do some solar evacuated tubes. Uh, plumb that in to insulated tanks, uh, some sort of heat exchange thing, and then to my in-floor heat. I had thought once about putting solar evacuated tubes on the inside of the back wall and the side walls of the greenhouse, but uh, the, the amount of fruit trees and things we have, it's going to be a fair bit of shading, and I might as well collect more sunlight from outside the greenhouse instead of inside the greenhouse, right? There's only so much sun that comes in and I want that sun to either absorb in the black thermal mass, water tanks, concrete, or reflect. So like this, this will absorb, this will absorb, this will reflect. Underneath the, uh, like this is extremely good use of space. I got these water tanks up out of the way. Underneath here are all the fish tanks at ground level. And then I just have my one biological filter grow bed as an aquaponic system test. And I put grow lights and reflective material up here. So LED grow lights. So 
it's not a huge electrical consumer. But essentially, me monkeying around and uh, setting it up this way, this is higher, so it's better for gravity pressure, and it's out of my way. Uh, the fish tanks are thermal mass and on the ground and all in a line. It's convenient to plumb it all in and make the system. That's out of the way. And then there's enough room to have the grow bed aquaponic system and a little bit of additional LED lights and super efficient use of space. And in ultra cold climates like uh, Saskatchewan, Canada, uh, it High-efficient buildings come at a premium, so the cost to build, the insulation that it takes, and it's really important to make good use of the space without any wasted space. So it, it was worth it for me to make those adjustments, essentially. I accumulated now, I think I have eight shelving rack systems, all the same. And this is a little microgreen test, you know, wheatgrass, pea shoots, sunflowers, radishes, um, and LED supplemental lights as well. And I have eight of these racking systems. So all of this concrete floor space at the back is both for potted fruit tree plants, plant starts, um, starting plants on these trays with additional uh, light if needed and microgreen trays and you know I have electrical up there that's pretty versatile and these are all on rollers so I could line them all up you know and there's lots of room this concrete is so nice to roll things on move things around nice and clean uh, spray it off and this is also grow area so concrete is grow area like I could have done concrete in this entire greenhouse and just did aquaponics and racking systems but because this is a multi-function this is like really good soil mulched in the ground like it's part of the earth but part but in the greenhouse and then this is also grow area but for potted plants and uh, stuff like that so again bringing permaculture principles when you make your system. Gravity, gravity to the fish tanks, gravity, natural fertilizer, gravity to here to water and feed my plants. And then when it rains again, it fills up and the same thing. So it's a natural ecosystem that I kind of created. Okay, getting into some plants. So Last spring, so about a year and a half ago, we bought for $150 one banana plant the size of this little one in a pot. And it was here, construction of the greenhouse, and they moved it a hundred times. And, and uh, But it turned into this mother plant that is hitting the ceiling, which is 13 feet high there. So it would be 15 to 16 feet high if it didn't have that ceiling. We have not got bananas yet. I think why is it's putting its energy into all its baby plants, the pups. Off of this one banana plant that we got, I've got eight pups off of this one. And you can see, like, there's, I have to uh, take one or two of these off. But there's already big banana plants coming and then more coming on the way. I've already potted them. Like, this was a little pup and it's already like eight feet high so literally off of those one banana we could have we could be taking pups off and fill this entire greenhouse as a banana plantation um, this banana is a pup off of the other one and I put this in maybe a couple months ago three months ago and it's got pups coming <coughs> So this banana is, uh, it tastes like uh, vanilla ice cream when we get bananas. And this one's your standard Cavendish banana that you're used to at the grocery store. But pups coming off of there. Uh, fig is, we do get figs off of here. We've ate figs a few times. There's some more coming now. But this was a cutting 
I don't know, about a year ago, and it is flourishing. The fig really likes the greenhouse. Ah, uh, this is a grapefruit, and there is a little fruit on there, but it sure doesn't grow very fast. I'm not sure if it's happy in here. Look, we even have thistle pressure in the greenhouse. I have to come weed those out. And what's, what's neat is when I do uh, start weeding, it is, uh, there's not going to be much weed pressure once I, you know, a few years of getting all the weeds out by hand, we shouldn't have much of weed pressure. Tobacco was harvested, that did really well. Got lots of stuff in here. Uh, peppers coming out our ears. Can't pick them and make stuff fast enough for all the peppers in here. All different kinds. So we don't have much luck growing peppers outside unless it's a really specific summer. So it's nice in the greenhouse. Uh, wife, a few flowers, and then she's constantly cutting blooms off of that and stems off of that. Uh, we just harvested our huge cabbage patch that was here. So when we have time, we have to, you know, figure out what we're going to replant in there. Uh, along the front of this four foot wide sidewalk, there is room for all sorts of potted stuff. So we have uh, some more peppers, tomato. Tomatoes are like weeds. Uh, by the way, we just thinned out a whole whack of tomatoes. Um, it's just like a jungle of tomatoes. They're like weeds. but uh, And then we planted some on these climbers that are you know, eventually you're going to produce us tomatoes this winter. We left a couple tomatoes kicking around, so we still have fresh tomatoes all the time. Uh, cucumbers, English cucumbers. Got to pick some more here, I guess. But uh, I'm trying to stay on top of the plants and what my wife plants with climbing stuff. My wife's been on me to hang a string system from the roof uh, so like tomatoes and uh, cucumbers and things can climb all the way up and they'll probably get all the way to the roof if once I set that up but for now just wife planted cucumbers it was getting a, a mess ground cover jungle so I got some panels and some uh, just stakes and have that as some climbers for right now but I do have to figure out some sort of grid system where my wife doesn't have to go on a ladder and I can hang strings down all over the place uh, for all of our climbers. This passion fruit puts some lattice and you know within weeks it's like past the top and it wants to climb higher. So if I had mesh all here available, I'm sure that passion fruit would be up by the ceiling and it does have fruit on it also, yeah. Uh, eggplants we can't grow outside here, but we just harvested them all, and that was really a really nice treat. A few meals out of that. Uh, some older carrots, though. This is we're kind of eating, or the kids will come pull carrots out of here. Now carrots, we we know how to preserve when we grow them outside. We're, we'll our, they'll last us most of the winter, but uh, fresh carrots for the kids and it's just nice having fresh things all winter uh, lots of stuff flowers and food and flowers and food and where's this guy tons of stuff oh beets and lettuce so eating fresh lettuce all the time just beautiful stuff we have to figure out a schedule once we get our lives more organized, but uh, to keep planting more lettuce at different times. So as we eat this, then we have stuff that's ready to eat, stuff that's ready to eat. But some strawberries, grape, another carrot patch. We just eat so many darn carrots. Uh, parsley. Lots of stuff. Look at that nice flower. Some herbs. 
fun, fun. But this is what a Saskatchewan passion fruit looks like. Saskatchewan grown passion fruit. That's going to be really cool. And lots more coming. And just from a, uh, I don't know what that is, 10 gallon pot. So this sucker would be, want to climb all the way up to the roof if I could let it. Eventually I will probably just have climbers and some sort of mesh or lattice all the way up. Uh, potted plants in here on this side, so tons of peppers, peppers out our ears. There's a kale patch in there, more peppers, a few little things in pots. Uh, blueberries, he doesn't seem to be liking it in there. We have to actually put this outside when it's cold outside for a few weeks to let it have a dormancy period. This is a lime. Haven't got limes yet, but they are super happy. The aphids as well and white flies. Here's some white flies on a tomato, if you can see. That are really annoying, but I don't know if they do any harm. I don't think so. Little avocado that will grow into a tree. Here's some goji berries we can't grow outside in Saskatchewan. Uh, mango hates my guts, and I can't keep a mango happy. Uh, another little lemon that we started from seed, actually, this one. Some sort of rose bush it looks like. Tomato in a pot. These little cards, uh, beneficial bugs that we also tried to introduce that are good for white flies. Um, I don't, haven't seen any effect from those yet, but cheap little uh, little way. So, lots of different things my wife got uh, in here. There's ginger in here somewhere. Uh, things that we can't normally grow outside in Saskatchewan. Celery is nice and big. We slowly, when my wife's making soup usually, come get some celery stalks and good stuff. A few little things in here. Swiss chard is huge. Kale is huge over there. Uh, this is all our little citrus area essentially and some fresh ginger. We can't grow that here either. Lemons and limes. And our citrus, a potted banana. Uh, four figs of two different varieties. And these are growing like weeds, it's insane. The figs really like it, the conditions in the greenhouse. And we really, really like eating figs. So that works out good. Uh, I think we have three or four different types of oranges. This one's a Valencia orange. And where's an orange? There's some citrus growing. There's some citrus growing. Uh, fun stuff. I put another banana in here, so when this guy touches the ceiling, man, that's going to be nice to look at. You just feel good next to these uh, citrus trees in the middle of winter especially. Just as good feeling in here. Some ornamental stuff a little bit. Some kale. And it, because the greenhouse doesn't get cold, we might not get super sweet kale, but uh, it is there and we do eat it nonetheless. Here's some older mint that kind of looks a little bit hurting, I guess. But, uh, yeah, so figuring out best, most efficient planting, where to plant things, and uh, we've got quite a bit of food growing in here. And uh, it's very, very nice. It smells fresh in here. Um, the fish don't smell it up. Um, what else can I show you? 
So I'm behind again on YouTube videos, so I, I'll do a detailed YouTube video of this, how I bolted them down, they sit right over the, the main beams, and they're completely safe. Oh, another thing I, I did, I added, uh, so now I have four fans that pull 100 watts a piece, and the fan, it blows the hot air from here down to here, and it moves the plants ever so slightly. Like if you can see that cucumber leaf is moving, everything's moving. So there's no leggy, weak plants in here. It is, uh, that airflow is needed. So unfortunately, 400 watts full time during the winter is an electrical consumption that we do have. But in a closed up ecosystem, you do need that air moving. But these guys are bolted down right over the beams. I have to do a YouTube video on this. I have to do a YouTube video on making yourself a uh, aquaponics biological filter to keep the fish water nice and clean and them happy. I have to do a YouTube video on how I made uh, fish tanks and wrapped it with plastic for thermal mass heated uh, uh, fish tanks. I uh, have to do a video on aquaponics and the biological grow bed with the flood tanks, making yourself a bell siphon, little temporary filter I added there to collect some solids, but the biological filter mostly does it. Uh, I'm biting off so many elephants, um, but if you can see without the sun, outside we're digging a pond, the, uh, the backhoe is still there. We got one more day of digging tomorrow before the, the weather doesn't permit us. So I've got that elephant and I'm taking the uh, clay I needed to build up my site for where my barn is going and we're gonna start on a barn and I'll probably build the whole thing myself starting next spring. But not a huge amount of work in here lately because I'm making hay while the sun shines and doing all these other projects. But this winter I have to finish metal cladding still on my walls. I have to finish all the plumbing system and do automatic systems for that. Uh, cover these up, uh, build another seven or so fish tanks, finish the bathroom, finish the sauna, church it up a little bit, make it really nice place to, to be with some cedar material and some wood. I just hate the cold feeling. Like just having this cedar lattice and cedar trim just makes me feel good. So I'm gonna do that. A Little bit of electrical and things. So that's gonna be the sauna door, the screen. You can have the screen wide open to regulate temperature. I did a whole video on my double-double doors but uh, this is two used doors, opposite swings, with a huge airspace in between. And the inner door is in line with the vapor barrier, so you don't get any frost buildup. And that air is a significant insulator. So this door is probably has twice as much resistance insulating value than a standard built house. It's just, you know, two doors and a huge airspace. And... Yeah, so obviously I've covered double wall poly. That's working really good. Polycarbonate on the outside, six inch airspace and poly on the inside. These are opening windows and the poly goes in front of those and that's a significant insulator having that air gap as well. Another thing that I did is last year I just had the poly draped down but this year I took a little rubber hammer and some strips of puck board and I jammed some puck board so the poly is kind of almost air or more airtight in there. So you can see the humidity because it's super cold outside. The humidity is on the inside of the poly and it will gravity go down into there. Nowhere for it to trap and go into the dirt behind that puck board. Um, so that's working really well. That'll help with any heat loss that I might have had last year. Changes I would have made, uh, not a single one. 
except for the Chinese style greenhouses that have more of an air gap and the insulating roll up blanket in between that they can roll down at night. You know, I might spend the time and, uh, and do that. That would be a huge or quite a large uh, insulator for at night when it's cold outside and the sun isn't shining. But uh, I'm tired. It works. You know, a little bit of heat loss at night. It's whatever, right? It's, uh, it's as good as you can get it, but it could be better with an insulating blanket. But again, it's, you know, is it worth, worth it to do that? We'll see. Okay. Oh, got, our, got Wi-Fi in here. Oh, that's nice. So that, that can control all sorts of different probes and things to monitor the different temperatures of fish tanks and moisture levels and who knows what crazy stuff, technological stuff I can do to automate this so I'm not out here in the summer watering, you know, 20 minutes a day or half an hour a day. It can automatically do things. And I think it's worth my time to... Uh, to set these systems up. But life is good. So again, this concept is a multifaceted uh, small farm system. So from fish protein to rainwater harvesting to microgreens to citrus to vegetables people are used to where I live uh, to starting plants. The wife might have a plant sale next year on the concrete. Like when it's cold in the winter, we could be starting plants either on the concrete, on tables, on racking, right? Very multifaceted. And spending the money to do this, a super insulated deep winter structure. So again, maybe I could have built uh, hoop houses 30 or 40 times the size of this to make a massive greenhouse business. But then I'd have a massive heating bill. Um, if I wanted to use them year round or extend my growing season. Whereas this barely has a heating bill. So why is that important? Natural gas in Canada is only going up 10% over the next six years, which is like a reduction in the cost when you factor in inflation. But um, in places like the Netherlands and Europe, where natural gas is over 10 times the amount, in Holland, um, you know, I have a relative in Holland, and Holland has lots of greenhouses. Um, their greenhouses are inoperational because of the high cost of energy. So all their just glass or hoop houses or whatever they have, and winters here, I don't think it's as sunny as Saskatchewan where I live. But if natural gas went up 10x where I live, guess what? I'd probably be the only greenhouse operational. So it's a little bit different, you know, from a capitalist perspective, you know, does it make sense? Kind of. It would be probably, you know, to actually make a business, you want inefficient big hoop houses and natural gas heaters maybe. But from a preparedness standpoint and a resilience standpoint, uh, this is the system I created. So it's like a large homestead greenhouse I'm, I'm definitely not going to feed the world or, or my entire community, but I can feed ourselves and a whole bunch of, you know, a smaller group of people. And uh, that's what it's all about at this point in the game. So super efficient, super good building, uh, as energy efficient as you can possibly get things. And that was our strategy. So hopefully you, you enjoyed that upgraded tour. If you haven't seen our first tour uh, that I did nine, ten months ago, you can see the progress that we have made. I'll put a link to that in the description or in the YouTube uh, thing. You can check that out. Uh, I think I covered everything. Angles of the sun, the solstices, the air movement, the aquaponics, thermal mass, rainwater collection, uh, concrete thermal mass, tour of all our plots, so let me know if that was helpful or if you enjoyed that. And hopefully it gets miserable outside so I can't do stuff outside, which means I get to finish the inside of this and 
get back working on this and get caught up on my, I don't know, dozen YouTube videos that I should have done, but were so many elephants, you know, lack of time. But stay tuned and uh, I'll fully explain these systems, especially um, a little bit better. So thanks for watching. We'll talk to you next time. Hey, leave us a like, a comment, a share. We put all this information out completely free. We have received no government grants or financing of any kind for any aspect of any of our many operations. And when you do leave a comment, I do try to get back to you to help you guys out as well. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next video.